Welcome everybody to the first episode, the first episode of the Too High podcast featuring uh, Deontay Lee and Seth Galina. I'm Seth Galina alongside my co-host, official co-host, uh, Mr. Deontay Lee. Um, for the people who are listening for the first time, uh, we used to be the college football, PFF college football podcast. We're now the Too High podcast. Um, for those who, again, for those who are listening for the first time, if you kind of curious what we talk about. Uh, Deontay is a defensive coordinator at a high school in San Diego. I am a division five flag football quarterback in Montreal, Quebec. And that's really all we talk about. I talk about all the interceptions that I throw. And then Deontay talks about all the interceptions that his kids make. So if you're not into that, uh, I'm sorry, but this is all we, we spend three hours per podcast and I break down each one of the horrible uh, throws that I make uh, in my flag football games. Deontay. Uh, it's a too high podcast. What's going on? Uh, not much, man. Feeling good. Um, like you said, just talking about you know our own exploits in football, and not at all about <laughs> the NFL or college football. You know, I'm feeling good coming off of this past weekend. Uh, our guys performed well, and I think that Seth is misrepresenting his play. Uh, the <laughs> last I checked, he was being called the Quebec and Mahomes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's a. Uh, I think it's a little misrepresentation, but yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be, you know, full-time co-host now. You know, I think we kind of covered, you know, when I became a full-time analyst here and this was kind of part of the deal was getting this prepared to roll this out and expanding, you know, our conversations about football beyond just college. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think that the way that we talk about it kind of draws a, a nice little through line between what's happening at the college and the pro level. So it should be a good time, you know, talking about this stuff with you. Yeah, I think pe- like people ask, I guess, like what, like how do we talk about it? Like, like what are what are we trying to? What's our like angle here? And I, I don't know. I always like to say like we don't really have an angle. We just we are we both. You still coach football. I don't coach football anymore. But we, so we're both like football coaches. But we just talk about football the way we like talking about football. So it is scheme oriented, but also at the same time, we're, it, that doesn't mean like we can't just like talk football like everyone else does. Like we like football, so we're going to talk football in the way that we uh, want to talk football. And like like Deontay said, we are going kind of mix and match college and NFL. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on the NFL side, like kind of behind the scenes. So we felt like it would be a good opportunity to kind of talk about uh some of the stuff that we've seen on tape and stuff like that but we'll also like both of us are big college football fans and obviously we had the college football podcast so we don't want to leave anyone in in, in in leave anyone behind when it comes to college football and, and we're going to be watching the games and we're going to be following and and we'll have a, a beat on that uh on a weekly basis we are going during the season two uh podcasts a week so you'll get them on tuesday morning and thursday morning i believe uh, so more recap preview type of thing and then split college football NFL. Uh, most of the time you'll get just me and Deontay, but we will have some guests on during the season. Um, and then in the off season, uh, a lot of guests, nonstop. Um, but uh, we're here. It's the first episode and um, and we're, we're both really excited. It's a two high podcast, a non marijuana related podcast. Just got to put that out there. This is not a marijuana podcast. Um, anyways, yeah, uh, let, let's get into it. Um, let's get into it. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about um, is where we are defensively in the NFL. So we, this is something we've talked about the, the, for the past six months. But w- what kind of like brought me to this point uh, moment of clarity i think the last week was i went on youtube and kurt warner has his own uh, youtube page and he uh breaks down quarterbacks breaks down offense defense whatever one of the cool things that he did and i highly recommend everyone go watch it uh i think i forgot the name of his youtube channel like quarterback confidential or study ball or something like that and he broke down the famous uh 2009 uh wild card game between the packers at Cardinals when it went to overtime and I think it ends because Rodgers gets sacked and he kicks the ball up in the air and card the Cardinals return it for a touchdown anyways in that game Warner breaks down I'm pretty sure like 
80% of the throws that he makes. I think there's a few that he skips, but about 80% of the throws he makes. So remember, it's 2009, and, he, and they torched him. They absolutely torched Green Bay, and Warner is on fire. But when you look at Green Bay's defense, it is cover two. Like, it's Tampa two for... Oh, it felt like every play. It was like Tampa two, or it was um, uh, two man. And then they would even when they when they zone blitz, they would even roll to cover two sometimes. So like they were they were really trying. This is Dom Capers defense. They're really trying to stay in a two high cover two specifically Tampa two specifically shell. And obviously that was just the meta at the time. And then we move into the Seahawks realm for the past ten years, let's say. As we, as we leave the Tampa 2 era because for uh, many reasons, too much speed on the field, Mike Linebackers can't do it all anymore and all that stuff. We move into the, the Seahawks Legion of Boom era, which from what I understand about the early days when, when Pete Carroll moves from USC to, um, to Seattle, they they didn't set out to be this, oh, we're just going to play cover three, cover one from already rotated pre-snap looks. Like It just kind of came together that way because of the personnel. Uh, because I don't right. think that's what Pete was at USC. No, I mean, Monty Kiffin was a defensive coordinator under Pete Carroll for a while, you know, and Monty Kiffin as well as, you know, Lovey Smith and all those guys who were, you know, around Tampa Bay and Chicago. Like, we're talking about the pioneers of Tampa too, so – you know, to your point about, you know, kind of where football was, like, that's kind of what it was. I mean, did teams kind of, like, toggle around with cover three? Of course. I mean, and was there cover four before? Of course. And was there cover one before? Of course. But Tampa 2 was, like, the default um, style of defense, especially, like, when you're talking about dealing with the two-back stuff. And then, you know, as you kind of pointed out, you can't really do that anymore because Tampa 2 was built for two-backs when there's not many guys split out in the space. It's a little bit different spatially when you start talking about 11 personnel and some of these four open looks where even the tight end is split out. So you now that's kind of what we're looking at. And like like you were saying, as you were going over the history of Pete Carroll coming from uh, USC to Seattle, I mean, he did kind of fall into that, you know, and it helps that, you know, your your initial draft, you come up with maybe the best free safety of this era. You know, <laughs> I think that kind of expedites it a little bit. But um, that's basically what it was, is, you know, that evolution from, Tampa two and being able to use your linebackers to solve all your problems, to get into cover three and using safety rotation to solve a whole bunch of your problems. You know, that's kind of where football went in that 2008 to 2013, 14 period in time. And so like once you're, if I kind of, in a sense, they became accidentally the best defense of all time. And it's like, (laughs) and then as we know, you know, defense or scheme spreads when you have when teams are doing good stuff like that's how it's going to spread people want to copy what good teams are doing so that becomes the uh, defense du jour in the um, in the NFL for a decade basically and it still kind of is where you have these um, you know Gus Bradley goes away and Dan Quinn goes away and all these guys end up somewhere else Roberts uh, Saleh goes away and you, you have this defense that spreads throughout the league. And then with that, you have just people looking at the tape and saying, hey, this team is really good at doing this. We should copy it because it seems to be working. Right. So you're, you're getting these like one high looks. And like, I you know, the, the first year we have data on uh, coverage, I think it's 2016 for the NFL. And you look at the Seahawks. And this is like, again, this is like a few years into their domination on defense. And they are showing cover one. Sorry, they're showing one high. Um, at the highest rate in the league uh, by far. It's like crazy. It's like 60%, something like that. Well, they'll show um, an already rotated one high safety uh, defense to the quarterback pre-snap. And then they can play either cover one or cover three out of it. But as we, we've talked about this before, there's there's some gray area between those two coverage, especially when you already rotated um, right. to one high safety pre-snap. So like this is the defense. It, it spreads. So now... The question is, are we entering a new era of defense um, based on what we've seen, honestly, mostly last year when we felt like we had an explosion of a lot of different two high defenses? 
and not too high to play cover two, to play Tampa two, like um, like we started at the beginning here with that Packers 09 defense, but a too high defense to play a lot of quarters. Right. So th- that's my question to you is like, is this, is this the end of the, the cover one era? Um, you know, it'll, there people will play this defense um, in 2021. But are we starting to see the move away from that where, you know, let's say th- three years from now, the meta is too high, you know, whatever Brandon Staley had did in, in, with, with Los Angeles, is that the meta or Fangio too? I, I think that that's where we're probably going to see the game go over the next half decade. Like, and this is kind of, you know, coaching brain for me, but it's a very natural transition to me from – cover three to cover four, given where offenses are at now and the way that they're using space, like the way that, I mean, if you, if you just look at the numbers in the coverage, right. In terms of like who's underneath and who's deep going from four under three deep to four deep three under, like it's not that huge of a leap, you know? And I think that now because offenses are more comfortable throwing the ball vertically, you know, out of 11 personnel, you know, it used to be that, you know, you spend first down, you know, second and regular and 21 personnel, then you'll get into 11 to get the ball out of the quarterback's hands fast, right? And that's still a big piece of it. And I think quarterbacks have become even more efficient at throwing the ball underneath. But now the more that the more time is being spent in 11 personnel, the more we're seeing offenses say, we can still run all of our deep play action stuff out of 11, you know, and use our slots and, you know, our Z receivers and use all this motion and stuff like that to be able to create – these huge holes in like cover three defenses. You know, when we talked to Brandon, to Brandon Staley, he made mention of that. Like it's about layering, you know, within your defense, having the ability to handle all the different ways that offenses can manipulate space, you know, without coming at the sacrifice of fitting the run, right? In the perfect world, if you really wanted to stop both, I mean, I think every team would just play two man, right? And you would just dominate up front. And, you know, run with the back wherever he goes and you make your tackles, you know, at or near the line of scrimmage that way. You know, that's not necessarily a realistic way to go about structuring your defense. So being able to play zone that's balanced, right, instead of cover two, which I consider unbalanced, right, because you have way more guys underneath than you have deep. And now that creates issues with how you're matching and relating the routes. What are you doing with your corners? What are you doing with, you know, those curl droppers? Are they carrying guys vertically? Are they not? Are you playing Tampa 2 where you're basically playing three some version of three deep where it's kind of like two deep, four under, and then one in between? Um, you know, like what that those types of issues get exposed. You know, I, I think that, you know, you and I have talked and shared film of teams getting into Tampa 2 or cover 2 or inverted 2. You just see guys running posts and up the seam untouched, right? So it's just not a tenable coverage anymore. And now – You know, in the modern game, the response is if you want to stay, you know, in that middle of field open world, you need to have the seams covered because offenses are putting receivers in the seams. You know, sometimes the the easiest answer is the simplest one. It's about matching up bodies and matching up to space. And I think that that's probably where where the game is at or where it's going if that's not where it's at right now. Yeah, I think for me, the thing that blew my mind, I talk about this a lot, but it's the, the Rams, Packers, playoff game in fact you can really go back and watch both the rams defense in their two the whole season last year but just in the playoff games last year but the rams packers game is one of the wildest defensive approaches that we've seen in a long time did it work i I, yes maybe yes maybe no you know if on the other side of the field jared goff actually does something and moves the ball then maybe it looks a lot better um but if they held rogers and that offense a, a little bit. Um, and what they were doing was they were saying, we're going to take away as many passing options as you can pre-snap. And we're going to force you to check into a run as often as possible and, and you know, make take the ball out of Aaron Rodgers' hands. And we're going to do some funky things where uh, a weak side safety is going to be both a – pass coverage player in the deep half, deep quarter of the weak side, but also come down and 
fit the run on the inside. Like not even mm-hmm. just like, oh, he's going to come down late when the ball right. on the edge rolls all the way. Yeah. It's when the ball kind of like, like, you know what we say, like the, when the ball rolls off the table to the sideline mm-hmm. and he can just clean everything up. No, he's like, he's fitting right in like the middle of that. Like a gap fitter, like a mic. Like a mic. Right? Yeah. Um, from depth. And, right. you know, that is extreme. I'm not saying you're going to see a lot of teams get into that uh, from day one in 2021 for sure. But just the fact that you saw a defensive coordinator kind of go that route in a very extreme version of being like, hey, we're literally just not going to play. Every time the Packers went trips, especially from gun, there was no linebackers. It was literally a 5-0 look. And they covered up Devontae Adams as much as possible because, and we're going to talk about this actually on um, on the next show, on the next week, on the Thursday show, um, with a, we're talking Packers on that show. But like the Packers want to run a bubble screen with Devontae Adams. They just said, no, it's not. Like pre snap, you're not throwing it. You, you got to right. hand the ball off. And they were banking on the fact that they wouldn't get gashed up the middle. And they kind of did it. I mean, there were some runs here and there. But at the most part, I thought it was like not bad what they were trying to do. And you kind of understood what they were trying to do. So, again, I don't know if that is the what we're going to see going forward at where you're going to get five zero boxes every time a team goes three by one trips. But we saw that at least there is a defensive coordinator out there who is willing to move his pieces around and kind of do stuff that's a little uh, unorthodox for sure. Um, right. Especially, again, having been here for 10 years in this one specific defensive structure. Right. I and mean, yeah. To me, like, it's not even just a Packers game. I was going back and watching um, when I did uh, my post about some of the favorite, like, pressure patterns that teams have on third down or on obvious passing downs. And I got stuck watching the Rams. I think a lot of people, you know, if you're if you're interested in scheme from a defensive perspective, people have heard of the ways that teams run fire zones, right? Three deep, three under. Um, that's been the very typical way. There are some clips of the Rams where they're running a fire zone, so they're rushing five guys, but they're playing like a quarter shell to the passing string, where it's like three by one, and you and I know what stump means, but, you know, for the people who don't, it's basically like playing cover four over three receivers, where that curl flat player that you would typically think is just playing an area also has to carry a vertical. So it's a way to kind of play four over three and match all these verticals. And then you're seeing like your John Johnson, that weak safety that you mentioned in the Packers game, who's fit in the box is rolling down. And now he's like a flats player. So like he's matching the back out weak. And that was something that I just had not seen before in the NFL. That's not to say that it's never been done before, but to see a team basically get in the bear rush five, you know, so you're bringing, bringing a guy off at each edge. And now you're you're kicking a linebacker, a true linebacker, out in the coverage and bringing a weak safety down near the box as a run fitter and a guy who's you know carrying the seam out into the flat um, in coverage. You know that that to me is a much different approach than what you would see before. You know when you're talking about the guys who are off of that Carroll Legion of Boom tree, they would just stay in three deep, three under, or they'd get in cover one and not bother with it. You know, and there's nothing wrong with that if you've got the dudes. You know, Atlanta basically walked all the way to the Super Bowl defensively just playing cover one and rushing five. You know, and they were up. You know, we all know what what happened in the Super Bowl. But, you know, it's a legitimate thing to say that they they were dominating basically all the way up until the second half of the Super Bowl that season, you know, just playing cover one and rushing five or playing cover three and rushing four. Um, And there's still a place for that. But now I think that, you know, as we continue to see – offenses, space to, space to field out, space to field out, space to field out. These kinds of answers, I think, will become a little bit more popular um, and will be more of a change-up in order to handle, like you said, these bubble routes, these spread concepts, um, all these ways that offenses are manufacturing catches, you know, in that 5- to 10-yard area for your Tyreek Hills and your Devontae Adamses and your Keenan Allens. You've got to have a numbers advantage. It's not enough to just say, we're going to put our best guy on there because offenses know based on your leverage and coverage, how to attack that. Now it's like, no, we need to have a numbers advantage. So that way, if there's any route run, we have a guy that's standing in that area or a guy who can match that route body to body. Um, You don't always get that in cover three. It works very well for that out of two back 
which is why it's very popular against two back. Um, but it's not the same against your 11 personnel, your three wide, your four wide types of sets. Um, so for that reason, I think we'll continue to see this transition into what I consider just like a more balanced and layered attack against, you know, your spread look. So you, you talk about, you mentioned uh, a coverage before called stump. And I think that's actually interesting to bring up, to bring up because I think stump and its sister uh, stubby, which I'll explain in a minute, are, are kind of the two coverages, especially against trips, that I think we're going to see in the NFL a lot. So I think when we talk about quarters defense, and um, if you go back and, and look at teams running quarters, because it, it still it still existed. You know, I, you know, some of we, I don't know if we have to bring this up, but like when we talk about a certain uh, coverage, a lot of these things have existed for a long time, and a lot of these things teams are playing. It's not like it's not like the the, the Seahawks only played one coverage or, or two right. coverages. Like they had stuff that they did, um, but we're talking about what they based out of, like what you what you hang your hand on. But anyway, so we talk about like quarters coverage for the most part, especially in the, in the NFL over the past however many years, you're talking about what I think a lot of us would understand quarters coverage as, which is like the two safeties are deep and the two corners are deep. And then you have three underneath players, like you were saying, uh, three under, four deep. And you have the three underneath players are like your you know, two linebacker types and a nickel or three linebacker types with a Sam there. And they're just kind of, you know, looking for the run at first. You know, they have run fitting responsibilities and then they're going to expand on a pass. They're going to expand from inside out. And we talk about the nickel or the Sam. He's going to be inside of the slot receiver. And on the other side, the will is going to be inside of the slot receiver. And he's going to expand through from the inside out through that nickel through that slot receiver. And now with Stubby and Stump, what you're seeing is Nichols be outside leverage of that slot receiver. And that changes how the fit is. Safeties have to get more in the fit. They have to kind of split the fit um, between the nickel and the safety to that side. But one of the things is, so with, with Stubby and Stump, and especially Stubby, what you're doing is you're telling the corner, you're locked on to the outside receiver in trips. So now we've, we've, we're, we're saying living in a world where he's not getting the ball. He's the furthest receiver and he's getting pressed. So right. he's not getting the ball. Like, forget it. He's not getting the ball. Or they're throwing a fade and we're living in that world. We don't care. Mm-hmm. And now you're, you're condensing the field a bit because in a sense, you're playing cover two-ish to the other 10 players on the field. Or at least right. to that side, to the, to the field side, to the passing right. strength, like you said. And this is kind of where defense I think is going in in another way that's going to be not just your regular quarters which is still a viable option but now we can see that hey we we have this player that uh, we can move outside and really now we're we're less conflicted at least for outbreaking routes and what do you want to do against a quarters team is you want to throw short outbreaking routes and we're, we're kind of like eliminating that a bit. And we're, and we're like I said, we're condensing the field of playing 10 on 10. So I think that, um, so that's stubby where you're playing man to man on the outside. And then let's say a cover, a zone cover two type thing to the other 10 players. And then, and then stump is similar, but the corner, instead of being impressed man to man, he's playing off man to man, basically. Right. Right. One is just a looser. Stump is just a looser coverage version of Stubby. In Stubby, you're kind of like trying to contest every route that's thrown. In Stump, it's more like, hey, we think that they might throw the ball vertically. And if they do, we want to make sure that we have layers in the coverage. That way there's more vision on the quarterback. Like the issue with Stubby, as you were mentioning it, if you guys could picture how, how he was laying it out, what basically is happening is that you're kind of playing almost like cover four with or cover zero with one underneath defender being that that backer, that linebacker underneath, um, at least if everybody runs vertically. In stump, it's a little bit more like, hey, we're kind of zoning cover two on the inside number two and number three receivers. So those two slots are the slot and the tight end. So there's a little bit more kind of like lax 
in coverage. There's a little bit more looseness in the coverage. And what that allows for, you know, when there are certain like exchanges and routes or teams run like their flood concepts or their vertical concepts, things like that. There's a little bit better body positioning um, on those types of routes. So, you know, and again, you know, in comparison with your cover threes, the issue with cover three against single back is that you're effectively turning your coverage into single coverage all across the board, right? There's just not the same kind of numbers advantage in the coverage distribution, which is why it's been so difficult for teams to replicate what the Legion of Boom has had, right? It's when they when they have a true number one corner, Richard Sherman, you know, a viable number two corner that's protected by the fact that you have the best free safety in football. And then you have a plus nickel, whether it's a Jeremy Lane when he was healthy, you know, the other guys who have kind of like, you know, rotated in and out there, they, they did a really good job of developing that slot corner role. You're basically eliminating a lot of the problems that happen within the coverage with the athletes that you have, you know, and I, and I mentioned this when we talked with, with uh, Chris Vassar, with Coach Vass, you know, some things, some problems on defense, you have to handle with scheme, meaning we want to get a numbers advantage. We want to have bodies in certain positions. And then there are some things that you have to handle with either your ability or your technique. So the the thing with cover three is that how you handle some of these things is with your technique. You know, being outside leverage, like you said, um, playing what you would call a scooch technique, meaning that you're kind of sinking off like a soft cover two corner in your zone. So as a guy runs vertically, you're basically just trailing behind him the way that, you know, if you can picture a cover two corner, like a Charles Woodson when he played for the Packers, kind of sinking underneath those deep routes from the number one receiver because he knows he has help over the top. It's the same kind of idea. Um, now, in the quarters world, those guys who are overhangs can play a little bit more aggressively because they know that they have help vertically in a lot of these scenarios. Um, and then when you start talking about three by one, then it just becomes a matter of are they trying to run more underneath routes? If they are, then you probably want to be in a stubby or in a tighter coverage, which you would call a man match version of the coverage. If they're not trying to run underneath routes, if they're trying to either high low you or create these different levels or run vertically, in those cases, you probably want to be more in a stump, or more in your kind of what you would call a zone match, where you're playing a little bit looser in coverage. And that's the advantage that you get against more spread looks in cover four, is that there's a little bit more multiplicity in how you want to handle those spread passing concepts. Whereas in cover three, whether you're playing true zone cover three, your zone match cover three, or you know your man or man match like cover one, it's all kind of distributing that's it. That's similarly. The four. That's the four. Like, that's it. Like it's basically distributing similarly against the spread, where you know that like the same problem routes that exist versus true zone cover three are also an issue mm -hmm. against zone match cover three are also an issue against cover one. Um, in quarters against the spread, there's a little bit more relief on certain route concepts depending on the style of coverage that you want. So that's kind of that's what. I think quarters has an advantage on in terms of like that in comparison to cover three against these spread passing offenses. So besides, you know, you talk about one of the issues of people playing the, the Legion of Boom defense is like, well, if you don't have the talent, then it's kind of a problem. So, but so besides like, okay, well, you're, 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 um, you know, whichever team you are and you don't have the talent, you don't have Sherman, you don't have Earl Thomas, you don't have the two linebackers, uh, you know, you know, the pass rush. Or, you know, if we go back further, you don't have, you know, you're trying to play Tampa 2 and then you don't have Erlacher and Briggs. Erlacher, right. You know what I mean? Like, or Derek so, Brooks. You or know. Derek Brooks, right? So, like, if you're, so that's one way that, off, that these defenses um, kind of get out of favor because all of a sudden uh, we copied you but we're allowing 35 points a game because we don't have the players, right? That's one way. And the other way, it's like, hey, the offense eventually is going to figure out um, what's going on here. So what I kind of feel like has really done in this kind of one high defense is the return to Shanahan in, in offensive uh, football. And really, it's the the ability to boot, the, the, not the ability, just the, the 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 willingness to get back under center and run your horizontally stretching run play, your wide zone, your outside zone, and then boot off that. You know, run your keeper off of that with the quarterback, 
And the issue with one high defenses is like once you once you run off one cornerback, you have a lot of underneath players who are tied to the run game. So if you want to play action and then one corner is being run off on a vertical route, you're going to boot to that side. You don't have a lot of answers for a guy who's coming across the grain. You know, the linebacker is stepping one way. You're living in a world where we, you know, they're, they're, a lot of these teams can run the ball well enough that, right. you know, you're, you're stepping to the run. And that's just how linebackers are taught. You're stepping to the run, especially, you know, in a one high world. And then you have this crossing route that's coming back, like I said, against the grain. You don't have enough players there to match it. And what ends up happening is you look at these defenses where you have a Bobby Wagner, a KJ Wright, who can, yeah, they're going to step to the run and they're going to be compromised to the run, but then they can flip their body and do what we, we call a robot right. technique and they can spin and run and turn and find the crosser and be an elite player. Like, again, that's not, that's not, always, that's not always what a lot of teams have. So, yeah. you know, that's why I see it. It's like it is so hard to deal with these boot teams, these keeper teams in a one high world. And again, especially if you don't have the talent there, um, because they're they're the the whole uh, for me it's like the horizontally stretching part of yes, the run game is super important. That's what it is right there. For to deal with cover three teams. And we've seen this return to now obviously Kyle Shanahan's a great coach and like it, it you know they all they everyone would figure this out eventually but it just so happens that you know, it it's um, the Shanahan tree, which, and I'm talking about the Mike Shanahan tree now, where it kind of felt like it had it had its time and place in the 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 Broncos Super Bowl run of ninety eight ninety nine, and then you know Kubiak goes to you know Kub- um, Clint not Clint um, Gre- uh, Jesus what's his name the father Gary. So he goes to he goes to Houston eventually. He was the offensive coordinator with the Broncos. He goes to Houston. They're running it, and they're having really good success with no quarterbacks there. You know, they're running the ball. Aaron Foster is running the ball great there. But the, it doesn't really spread that offense. You know, Alex Gibbs went to – he was the O-line coach with the Denver Broncos. He goes to Atlanta, and they have success doing it with Mike Vick. And – you know, they're running the ball really well when he's there, but it's like that it felt like just those guys and that was it. And not a lot of guys were coming off that tree running it. I could be totally wrong. It's not like I, I was like, you know, fifteen years old during that era. So maybe I'm wrong, but <laughs> but now it's like everyone's coming off that tree and everyone's trying to run that offense. And even guys who aren't part of that offense, Matt Nagy, is like, Oh my God, I don't have a quarterback. I need something I need to create something where I'm getting easy throws from my quarterback. Let me just get into that offense, which is so different. You know, we're, I'm getting off the tangents here, but like Matt Nagy coming from Andy Reid's tree, coming off Andy Reid's tree, off his coaching staff to become the Bears head coach, and they're running a lot of that stuff um, that Andy Reid was doing. And then last year, he was like, "Man, I can't do this anymore. Like, I don't have the players." So what does he do? He just right. copies what the best teams are doing, and he's going under center more. Uh, and they're booting uh, Trubisky, and they go on a run, and they go win six games or whatever. They make the playoffs, and, they, and, and you know they, they get into the wild card round. So that's what every team's doing. And it, and again, going back, it's like one of the reasons is because it's hard to cover these routes coming across the field when you're being horizontally stretched on in the run game. And the crazy thing is, you know, even the best Shanahan run games, and we talk about Shanahan, McVay, we talk about Stefanski. We talk about in um, in Cleveland. We're talking about Lafleur now. Both Lafleurs, um, one in the, with the Jets, one with Green Bay. We're talking about um, Tennessee. We're talking about Minnesota still. So it's like a lot of these teams doing it. Is you know you're, you, the the um, the the run game is like good. It's not a whole, they're not they're not like like it's not like you know it's not like tackle for a loss after tackle for loss, but it's not great. It's, right. But it's like the whole action, and it's kind of how we have to talk about it. It's like the whole action is creating positive yards all the time because you're getting the boot action that is easy completions time and time again. And that's what that's what it's about, man. That's what it's all about at the end of the day. It's like the, the number one piece of it that you mentioned is the horizontal stretch. That's the issue. That is the issue with playing middle of the field close to your cover one and cover three. It drains out the coverage, meaning that, 
off of like let's say it's like an outside zone bootleg so you show outside zone so now that flat player and this is a part of what i was talking about in you know this flow series of articles that i'm sure we'll probably come around to later on you're running let's say you're faking outside zone towards the tight end so now the flat player in cover three has to show up and run support so just like that he's drained out of the coverage now because you've activated a certain part of his job the linebackers have to flow with the ball now we're kind of drain we're draining out the strong side linebacker because he has to go fit up a gap. He's probably not going to add a whole lot in the coverage. The weak side backer, because the run is going strong, is kind of trying to overlap now in case the ball hits strong or they create an extra gap. So now you're putting him in an issue. Now you're creating an issue for him where he has these dual responsibilities where he has to fit up any extra gaps or clean up any busted fits that happen in the box. And then when it's play action and it's boot, not only does he have to match the track of the quarterback, so as the quarterback is rolling back out, he has to make sure that he kind of rolls back out as well. You mentioned that robot technique. He also has to roll over and try to find that deep over, that deep crossing route that's coming back because there's nobody else who's responsible for it. The other, the weak side flat player either has a slot or if it's out of 21 personnel, that fullback is running that split action and that slide route where he's out in the flat. This become, there just creates this huge issue of horizontal stretching and now if the quarterback can run if he can move a little bit he's threatening the line of scrimmage which puts that much more stress on that that weak side linebacker and that weak side curl flat player it's it's tough you know cover four you know uh, as a as a comparison does not have the same kind of issues because as that over route is coming that weak side safety that was carrying a vertical that does not have a vertical threat right now can pick up or match that over route that's coming back his way. That curl flat player can just take that little slide route or whatever that's coming out into the flat and that little down and out, you know, if it's a slot receiver or a tight end instead. And now that Mike backer, that middle backer who's just playing that middle hook area, all he has to do is relate to the quarterback's drop back, basically. He can kind of, he kind of almost operates as a spy. He gets to play underneath the over route as much as he can help. And then as the quarterback starts to attack the line of scrimmage, he can attack the line of scrimmage. So again, you know, that's that conversation of layering within the defense. In cover three, there's just not the same kind of lay there's not the same kind of vertical layering. There's good horizontal layering. So now as the bootleg happens, right, you have a guy who can handle the quarterback on the scramble. You have a guy for the slide route, and you have that middle hook player who could help you out in the scramble, but you don't have a guy who can carry the over route. So now you're asking your weak side hook player, that middle hook player, to do both, yeah. basically. Or you got to ask that Mike backer who was fitting up run to be able to, you know, haul ass and turn around and then pull up on the quarterback. That's a lot, you know. You're just asking a lot of guys. And, you know, I'm sure that I sound like I'm clinicking right now because this is the exact <laughs> conversation I'm having with my 15, 16, 17-year-olds about handling bootleg. You know, bootleg rules are a big deal in any coverage. Because of flow, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, the way that the way that these plays happen and the way that it stretches the defense horizontally and vertically, the way you have to contract and expand in the coverage, you need to have certain layers to be able to handle certain threats. And cover three just does not have the layers to handle these over routes, which is why it's always targeted as often as it is against these middle of field close coverages. So you get these targeted over routes that like on bootlegs. Uh, or just any type of play action that hit it about 12 yards, let's say right. something like that. And what ends up happening is in a one high world, you start saying, Hey, safety, my one safety, like you, maybe if you see it, like come down on it. Cause we don't have any other capabilities to stop that route. And then here comes the post, here comes the post. Because they're what what so the flood play that every team runs, um, and it's just a classic flood play, is a corner route by the wide receiver. So he's not necessarily wide, like it's not hugging the sideline. He's a little split, a little closer, and he's running a corner route. And the whole idea is, if I run a corner route against a one high team against cover three, that corner back has to take me the whole way. Period. End of discussion. Has he has yeah, to take has me to. the whole way. He can't pass me off yeah. to anybody. There's no one for him to pass yeah, a no sideline route to. That. 
So now he's out of the play, like we were talking about before, like you're, you're eliminating this one guy and then you're coming across the field with the, with the crosser. So who's left? Like you said, the only person who's left is, is, is either the, the weak side run defender who's got a robot and run and turn and that's the big deal. Or you just say, hey, safety, you see it because you, you have vision of the whole field and you have to come down on it. And we'll be an NFL team and we'll teach uh, our backside corner to overlap and do all that stuff. But like, man, again, it's tough. Now the, cor- the backside corner from where the run was going has to go and find a frontside route across the field and be the cover three safety, basically. He's got to replace the safety and be a cover. It's not easy. That's it's not like easy. really not easy to do that. And teams yeah. do it. Like in the NFL level, you see it happen. Remember the Saints got a pick of that pick on uh, mm-hmm. on Wentz against, uh, this is like three years ago. I don't still remember. I'll that. say that. That's like 2018. Yeah, 2019, yeah. They got a pick yeah. on Wentz uh, doing that. I think Lattimore got the pick. But like, yeah, like it's tough. So once that happens, what do the offensive teams do? Instead of running the corner, they show the corner out and they bang it back to a post. And the interesting thing for me is, and you saw Kittle caught one on like a Monday night football or a Sunday night football against the Packers like three years ago. Trey Lance hit one in the preseason a few weeks ago. And, you know, Rodgers hit so many of them, a few of them last year at least. It's like when, once we're, we put good quarterbacks in the Shanahan system, which is not something that they've kind of had a lot, I would say, you put Rodgers in that system where he's able to contort his body and make the and make it look like, hey, we're just throwing this crosser and you jump down on it and I can contort my body because I'm I'm the, the the best quarterback of all time and right. just be like and just like flip his hips and like throw the post back across across the green like. Man, it's tough. And then, yeah, so I think just getting back to to the, the original point, which is like, why did why did this all happen? Like, why are we here right now going into the 2021 season? And I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, you start with Legion of Boom unexpectedly becoming one of the best defenses of all time, running relatively simple scheme. And then eventually offense is figuring out. And a lot of that has to do with the wide zone system that is pr- pr- primarily not everyone runs it but primarily um run by um the shanahan guys from mike shanahan down to kyle shanahan and now mcveigh and all these people that i mentioned before all right don't forget guys if you go to the website pff.com you can get access to all pff subscriptions for 30 percent off if you use kickoff 30 uh, K-I-C-K-O-F-F-30 um, as a promo code. Uh, gain access to Fantasy Football Draft Guide, the player projections and the rankings, all of the locked article content, which is uh, honestly a lot of me and Deontay stuff, and then cheat sheets for Fantasy Football and all that stuff, and, and just everything you want out of um, PFF, all the grades, all the premium stats. So kick off 30, 30% off all um, PFF subscriptions. Uh, go get it as soon as possible. In these uncertain times, life is full of questions like, when should I start thinking about life insurance? But however difficult these questions may be, Western and Southern can help you answer them. Backed by over 130 years of experience together, we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. Western and Southern Financial Group, life insurance, retirement, investments. All right, so you wrote an article, it's on pff.com. It's a, uh, it feels like you're never, you've, continued to write this article for the past like three weeks so it's like a now become like a nine-part article on something <laughs> right. you talked about a little bit just now on flow so the floor is yours what is flow why is it important what's going on okay so i don't i try not to talk in like big grandiose terms about football because i think it sounds kind of corny but like this is one thing that i can legitimately say like for me as a coach and being able to take this into the way that I contextualize my analysis of the game, like this is the fundamental building block for just about everything in football from like a base level, at least like a a basic level. Obviously, you know, there are different things in terms of techniques and certain schemes and et cetera, et cetera. But if you have an understanding of this, this kind of will carry you through a lot of things. And like you said, that's flow. And basically the, the easiest explanation is, it's the way that the eligible receiving threats distribute themselves on a given play. Um, a lot of people talk about it in terms of like backflow, and that was something that I mentioned. Um, because in the two back world, the backs really influence the way that the flow works out, both in the run game and pass game. 
So there are these two concepts within flow. One is called split flow and one is called load. And split flow means that there are three eligible receiving threats that end up on one side of the formation, which you would call the strong side in terms of how many passing threats are there, and then two on the weak side, away from that strong side. Um, and, you know, when you start talking about, like, the run game, we were talking about, you know, with the bootlegs and stuff like that, like, that's a split flow play, meaning that one back is going one way and the other back is going the opposite. Or By the end of the play, there's going to be three receiving threats on one side of the ball and two receiving threats on the opposite. That would be split flow distribution. Um, load flow would be, you know, it's in the name, overloading the amount of receiving threats that are in a particular direction. So that would be four to one side, one on the weak side. Um, so, you know, you think about like your power play actions or like some of your flood concepts in the passing game. A lot of those are load flow and how they distribute. Um, and what that influences is a, you know, like I said, the kind of run games that you see. So your zone schemes are typically more split flow, your power schemes, your leads, um, your toss sweeps, jet sweeps, things like that. Um, you'll see a lot of those be a kind of load flow. Um, and what that does in load flow is creates additional gaps or you're creating an additional level in your passing concept. That's where, you know, the flood, the idea of the flood comes from. By having an additional receiving threat on one side, you can create an additional level in your route concept. By having an additional gap on the strong side, you're now putting stress on the defense, you know, when your power schemes and things like that. So defenses have to respond in a very particular way. In the run game against split flow, most of the coverages handle it well. You end up with, you know, two or three coverage defenders on either side, you know, and then your middle defender, whether it's your mic, your free safety, can create that four over three, you know, or your three over three if it's cover three with one guy in the middle of the field who basically overlaps by being the guy who protects you on any vertical throws. Um, in cover four, you would have your Mike Backer as your fourth defender to the strong side. That's where you get your coverage advantage. You would have your two deep players, your two quarters players, and then your curl flat player on the weak side to create your three over two there. Um, so that's kind of how it works out in the run fits. There are clips of that that are in the post that I put up. Um, and then, you know, in coverage, now we're coming, now that comes into the conversation of, well, how do you pass off things like drags? How do drags and, you know, flares from the backfield and these crossing routes and things like that, how does that influence the idea of flow? So your underneath defenders being able to relate to certain routes, you know, a drag comes from the weak side to the strong side. So everybody's got to match with that to be able to, you know, handle that four over that four over three or that load flow look if they get four receivers to the strong side, if there are already four receiving threats on the strong side and a guy drags back, there are rules within the coverage for somebody to be able to handle that. You know, we talked about that four to first crosser rule on this podcast where basically a guy is either responsible for matching the back or taking the first crosser coming back. There are all these different influences within flow. On the simplest level, it's just the way that these eligible receiving threats move across the field and the way that a defense has to react to it in order to keep good body positioning and numbers advantages where they need to be. Um, it influences things like play action concepts. It influences things like your pass protections. Certain passing concepts need to be protected a certain way. So that way the quarterback can read it out a certain way. Otherwise you'd have certain holes in your protection or you wouldn't be able to get to certain routes in time. Um, and then, like I said, in the passing game, um, for the offense, you know, you can kind of draw up any concept or progression that you want. That's where flow is a little bit more of an influence on the defense, how these routes distribute and how you'd have to respond to it in coverage. Um, and that's really what it's about. And then from there, you can layer on just like, just like we were talking about with quarters versus cover three. Okay, how do we want to play zone? Do we want to match in our zones? Do we want to play man? Do we want to have brackets on certain guys in man? Um, and how the flow of the offense changes the way that a defense thinks about how it wants to cover certain routes or certain concepts. That's really what I was kind of honing in on, you know, and within that you have your overlap player, the guy who sets the wall vertically and all those types of things. So it's a three-parter. I covered the run game. I covered pass protections. I covered play actions and your drop back passing game. And, you know, and by the end, 
I, I think that I kind of laid out a pretty clear picture of all the ways that flow, the concept of flow, um, influences the way that offenses and defenses move throughout the field. Uh, okay, when you're when you're um, breaking down a defense, uh, sorry, when you're breaking down an offense, like from a defensive point of view, and you're trying to chart them, you're trying to figure out what they do, is flow something that is part of like an individual piece that you're charting? Or, or is that just part of the makeup of a concept that you're charting? And you're just like, okay, well, we know that this is load flow because it's blah, blah, blah. Or is it something um, separate? I think it's it plays a piece in both. So I always start with flow just to give me an idea of what kind of coverage concepts. You know, this is something that we talked about with Vass. Like, what you do with your coverage dictates how you fit the run. So I want to know what kind of flow I'm getting so that way I call the right coverage in order to be able to prepare for how we need to set up our run support. Um, because, you know, I know how we're fitting gaps. What really matters is where am I getting my run support? When I spill the ball out to the perimeter, which is always the goal, or mostly the goal within, you know, fitting the run, where am I spilling it to? Who am I spilling it to? And can that player get there to affect the play? Um, so that's the first part of it. So now I might be thinking like, okay, you know, it's split flow. I might be thinking a little bit more like cover three. I might be a little bit more comfortable with that. And then it just becomes a matter of, is it more spread? Is it more two back? If it's more two back, I'm definitely going to go more cover three. If it's more spread, oh, then I might want to keep cover four in my back pocket. And then from there, the conversation becomes like, as I look at the passes, now I want to see the passing concept. So that way I'll make my final decision. If it's like they're working levels where it's like drag, dig, post. Oh, well, then I probably don't really need to be in quarters for that. You know, like I can probably handle that pretty well in cover three because the shell of the coverage is kind of made to be able to handle drag digs and posts, you know, layered on top of one another. If we're dealing with like these over routes where you're getting these vertical stretches, you know, your four verts concepts um, or like your high lows, then I might want to be a little bit more. I might lean a little bit more on like the quarter side. And then from there, you know, and I mentioned this in the article, it's like, what do you do out of three by one? Almost every offense has some kind of three by one look. What does that mean? Are you going three by one to run the ball weak? Well, that's split flow. I want to make sure I'm in a split flow call. So that way I'm not over rotated. You know, I think we've talked about that before. And now I'm getting hit on the weak edge where I've got no run support at all. And I'm asking my C gap defender, which is probably a pass rusher, to both fit his C gap and play contain. You know, that's a whole different world than what I typically would be asking him to do which is to spill through the C-gap. So that's probably not a fair ask of him. So I need to have some run support available for him. You know, or it's they're going three by one and they're running stretch to the strength. Well, that's load. I, I don't need to be in cover three for that. So I'm just going to be wasting a backside defender. I'll just get in cover four. And now I can set up my coverage in a way where I'm either sliding my linebackers strong to be able to handle the extra gap that they're creating with the run scheme. Or we'll get into, you know, like you said, your stubbies and things like that, where or there's another kind of form of that that's called Seahawk, where you're basically playing man underneath on everything. And now that frees up my free safety to say, hey, if you see run action and say it's like it's 11 personnel three by one and they're running to the tight end strong. Well, now my free safety knows, hey, if it's play action, I've got a little bit of support from that underneath man defender. I can come out the roof if I need to, if the ball beats us to the edge. Um so those are the types of factors that kind of show up. And then again, in three by one, it's like, what kind of passes are you getting? All right, if it's all verticals, I want to play zone match cover four. If they're flooding, we want to play zone match cover four. Um, are they running backside posts? Are they running posts from the number one receiver? Then I want to be in cover four. And now I'm telling that weak side safety, hey, you know, if the number three receiver is vertical, you've got him. If he's not, you're going to climb high because you know you're getting a post from either the backside number one or the field side number one, right? Like, those are all of the parts of those are all parts of the discussions that I'm having with myself and my defensive staff on like over the weekends as we're game planning. And you just diagram it out and make sure that if you have everything covered, it makes it easier, in my opinion, to fit the run because now you're not overextending yourself in either direction. And then from there you're just kind of layering your concepts. All right, if they run this, we want to run man match cover four. If they run this, we want to run cover one. If they run this, we want to run cover three. If they run this, we want to run palms. 
blah, 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 all those types of things layer on top of each other. So that's kind of the way that I, I, I try to approach it in terms of like how flow influences the way that I game plan on a day to day basis. Okay, I don't, I don't mean to. I know we're done the talk, the conversation we just had about uh, you know the Rams defense and quarters in the NFL, but something you said triggered me a bit, um, and I think we should clear it up because you talk about layers, especially mm-hmm. um, you know defensively in the coverage layers. So like the Rams and Fangio and you know uh, all these teams that are going to go to this style of defense, they're still playing cover three, they're still playing cover one. Mm-hmm. The, but when you start in a too high look and then end up playing cover three post snap, it's it's different. It's like it's com- different. almost yes. it's almost a completely different coverage um, than showing it again, like the Seahawks used to do, and like all those teams used to do. Like the, you talk about the twenty sixteen Falcons, they would sh- kind of show you what they're in and like make and like beat us. And with this, right. there's a little more subterfuge, a little more, um, uh, you know, uh, behind the curtain stuff where it's like, hey, we're, we're, we are playing cover three, but if we're using a safety to come down from depth, he can be either inside a linebacker, he can come down outside of a linebacker, he can be looking for certain routes from depth, you know, with, yes. with, with his eyes being able to see the whole field. So, like, it's, it's extremely different. You know, and you can chart it however you want. You can call them both cover three, but I think when you're looking at it from offensive perspective and even a defensive perspective, it, it's they're t- it's telling you two different things about how right. this play, how the how the how the the, the interaction is go- about to be between the offense and defense when you're running it um, from a too high look and coming down rather than already we're talking about already being rotated down into a one high uh, structure again like the Seahawks loved to do back in the day. So I think that that's an important thing to clarify is like. Cover three is not going away, right? But it's it's a very different type of cover the style three. Style and the approach to cover three has to change. Yeah, the idea of like we're gonna put a Sam backer out in the flats on one side and the weak safety out in the flats on the opposite. You can do that, but it doesn't really serve you the same way as saying like we're gonna base out of quarters and now instead of having a quarter safety that's carrying the seam. He's actually going to roll down and be a hook player. So now that creates some alleviate, again, to your point about layering. If it's three by one and you're getting that four verts look where that number three receiver is running that bender, that over route coming back. If it's a safety on the weak side that's rolling down to the middle hook, it's almost the same kind of layering as cover four. So now against the run, you still get the same kind of run fit that you want. And against the pass, the kind of issues that you would be bumping into in terms of, you know, that over route beating the leverage of your linebackers. Now, because you're coming from depth and you have a better athlete, a better coverage athlete, frankly, on the route, it distributes in a way that's not as much stress. Now, the issue with the issue on that side becomes like, how do you handle those strong side passing concepts? Because now that Mike backer has to expand way out to the strong curl. Um, but, you know, when we talk about, like, you're trying to solve very particular problems within a coverage, that's one way to solve a particular issue. And it marries up well to saying that, hey, we're just going to be more of a cover 14. That way, you know, you can at least add some multiplicity and diversity to, like, your coverage package and stuff like that. Okay, let's get into something that we haven't really talked about on, well, obviously this is the first episode of the Too High podcast, but even on the College Football podcast, we didn't spend too much time. But let's talk about the rookie quarterbacks uh, in the NFL. Everyone wants to talk about these guys. Uh, Lawrence Wilson, Lance Fields, Jones. Let's start with Lawrence. What have you seen so far that either tells you, yes, 100% this guy was should have been the number one pick, or maybe you're like, hey, maybe this guy is not this elite generational talent? I mean, Lawrence is as advertised. I think that most people kind of know. You know, I'm I'm the world's only Oklahoma, USC, and Clemson fan <laughs> on the planet. So <laughs> these are the three things that I spend the most time consuming in college ball. He's as advertised. Um, what I will say is that he's in a position where how good he is is probably not going to matter this season um, because of the lack of talent that's around him in Jacksonville, especially up front. I think that's with the, the running thing. With, yeah. Like that, I, I don't know how they move the ball in the running game. And, you know, with what Daryl Bevel wants to do with, like, the boots and trying to simplify the game for his quarterback by, you know, getting the ball out quick or 
running these play action games and stuff like that, where you're maybe trying to match protect and only running a couple of routes at a time. Like it sounds schematically, but you do have to have the bodies up front that can move guys. I don't think that they have it. And then that kind of concerns me long, t- not long term, but at least for season one in terms of how much you're going to be asking Lawrence to create with this feat, which he's more than capable of doing. But again, when we're talking about like a rookie quarterback, are we all, are we really going to be asking the guy to fit the ball into tight windows all the time because they don't have elite receiver talent? They have some guys that are decent, but not elite receiver talent. They're not going to really be able to move the ball in the running game. And my concern is that defenses are just going to sit in more too high or sit in these soft cover three zones. And there's not going to be the kind of airspace. And because they're not going to have a lot of time for Lawrence to run these downfield concepts to get behind those underneath defenders, he's going to be dealing with a lot of pressures. So worst case scenario, I think the way that I'm looking at it is, is that he has a high turnover season because there's just not a lot of time. So he's just deciding to fit the ball in the windows that he shouldn't, you know, instead of having to run for his life all the time. So that would be my number one concern. But I think in terms of talent, the way that he's leaving this preseason, especially what he put on display this past Sunday against Dallas, like I think that he's the exact kind of quarterback that everybody said that he was coming out of Clemson. Yeah, you talk about the receiving core in Jacksonville. It's like it's a good core, but are there any – the issue with receiving cores is like how many – how many like really good cores have there been without a number one? Right. So it's like it's like you have a lot of really good number twos. You know, Chuck is good and Marvin Jones is good and I, and and I'm really into the the really Lavisca is good. Like I, I yes. really like it. I like all of their skill sets. Hundred percent. None of the none of them are number ones, and their skill sets are all like combo multiplier types. When you have a number one, yeah. Whether even if it's just like our number one is this monstrous tight end that nobody can cover. It doesn't have to be Julio Jones, but having a true high target, high volume, number one can always beat one-on-one coverage, requires two bodies. Those, the rest of their receiving core, those are the types of guys that eat once you have that guy. So without it and with the kind of scheme that they're going to be running, it, it's really hard to set up some of the downfield throws that I know Bell is going to want without having a number one guy who can take the top off of the defense or require two bodies in coverage. Yeah, but but then again, like you said about Lawrence, you just see the um, the the understanding of space, like spatial awareness, is incredible in the pocket. Absolutely incredible. The, his ability to get off throws. You saw the one against New Orleans when he booted away uh, from his throwing hand and then was able to contort his body. You know, that's like Aaron Rodgers style. Um, right. So. That to me tells you that it, it'll be good at some point. It might not be good right, right. away um, because we just don't know. We still don't know about can he get through his reads? Can he do all this? Blah, blah, blah. But like it'll be good at some point because everything else is so good that you imagine a, a kid who has that type of, again, spatial awareness will figure it out. Like yeah. it just, I'm just not. I'm not, I'm not actually concerned. Yeah, I'm not actually. All my concerns are like it's not going to be perfect year one. Like we're not we're not going to walk away from year one. Like okay, MVP by year three. You know we can see it. We can see it clearly. We may see it in his talent, but maybe yeah. not in the situation. I, I and I think you're right about like him. I could see him trying to force a lot of tight window throws early. Mm-hmm. Um, again, because of the offensive line and because that's kind of who. That's who he's been. It's who he's been, and you brought this up before we started. Um, uh, recording but Clemson has kind of run this type of offense so it's like we don't know until you put them in an NFL system where they have to go through reads and they have to do a little bit more but we just assume that Lawrence is going to be like that like there's right. no reason not to assume I have because no, everything yeah, else I have does no is good. reason not to think that he's going yeah. to love it uh, okay so let's get to the number two pick that's Zach Wilson who has played pretty well um, as a Jet so far in the preseason my take from him, uh, you know, from the college perspective, was that I didn't, I don't, I don't know if he was good or bad. I just don't know. Just I, what I knew is that the tape from 2020 didn't tell you anything about Zach Wilson's quarterback ability um, because of the the level of play difference that BYU was facing last year. But he's looked really good. I think one of the things that I noticed with the Jets' offense is that they're not running a ton of stuff. So it's like you know that they were repping this stuff. 
you know, I'm thinking about two Corey Davis catches on the same play, same dagger, da- yes. dagger same dagger concept <laughs> in, uh, you know, week one and then week two of the preseason where it's like, yes. you know, they were repping the shit out of that play from that same formation, from that same call, and he hit it. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he read it out and he hit it. So it's like, it's all good, but you're, you are just wait- – and you could say the same for all these quarterbacks. We are just waiting for him to see – them play against other ones because that was a problem so far with the Jets. Their ones are playing against other teams' twos and sometimes threes. And threes, yeah. So that's a problem. So you want to see that, obviously. And then when, once you, you you start coming into an, a, a regular season offense versus a regular season defense, which just has so much more complexity in terms of, yeah, they're going to run that same dagger concept, but they're going to run it out of 13 different looks. Mm-hmm. So now you, it's, it's just like, yeah, you, you know, concepts do stay the same and it's easy for a quarterback to, easier for a quarterback to like, you know, be like, okay, well, this concept is the same. So I get to get my eyes here, here, here. But, you know, defenses are doing more elaborate stuff and you're running them out of different looks with different receivers. It does, um, it does change the picture. So like Wilson's been good. Um, you can't really knock him for anything, but it's like we just again we still don't know based on uh, the favorable situations that the Jets have put him in. Yeah, I was gonna. Say, I mean, situation is everything early in, in the quarterback's career. I will say that the system that he's in probably lends itself best to developing him and covering up some of the holes in his yeah. game. Um, you know, if Lafleur is really able to stay committed to, you know, I would put, I would run the exact same offense that they've been running for Jimmy Garoppolo in San Francisco early. Yeah, you know, there's no reason to break out a 21 personnel unless you absolutely have to. If it's not an obvious passing down, you can stay in 21 and 12. You know, try to hammer with the run game and then create as easy throws as possible. You know, I would, I, I think I recapped that that Jets Packers game, so I know those that dagger concept that you were mentioning that they threw a couple times in the first quarter. That's, I mean, that's going to be kind of like bread and butter. Okay, we know we're draining out the coverage this way. The window's right here. This is the throw. It's not a, hey, you're checking for middle field open versus middle field close. You're checking for press versus off. You're checking for the safety rotation. We're not going to do all of that. It's going to be off of play action where the protection is already set a particular way. You know, it's going to be off of certain looks, certain formations where you know exactly how it's going to work out spatially. Um, so if he's a hot start, you know, that's one of those guys where it's like, if it's a hot start, I'm going to have to sound like a hater because I know regression is going to come in the second half of the season when teams get a little bit more accustomed to handling it, because I don't think that they're going to throw a lot on him from a concepts perspective. Um, but if it doesn't look good early, I'll probably be concerned for the same reason. I know that they're not going to have a whole lot that they throw at him. So if he ends up in situations where they're always trailing, or they can never stay ahead of the sticks, and they've got to get into 11 personnel. He's got to deal with all these different then, pressure looks. Then he's going to look like Jimmy Garoppolo. Exactly. You know, there's going to be all these different pressure looks. He's going to have to start beating cover one with his arm, which he has an, just enough arm to be able to do it, but I don't know where he's at mentally yet in terms of the pro game. So, you know, that's that's really going to be it, is trying to manage the game, like you said, and like I said, the exact same way that Kyle Shanahan's been managing Jimmy Garoppolo up to I think that the nice thing is that you probably, unlike Garoppolo, you have a guy who can move around and make yes. a play. And we saw that in the Packers game as well. Move around, make a play. And we saw that all throughout his BYU tape in 2022. And then I, I think you won't, you probably don't have the boneheaded throws to linebackers that Jimmy has right. on the tape. And, and that might and, and that might be just because Zach has not shown on tape that he wants to throw those balls. So it's like, well, he's going to work out just because he doesn't want to throw the ball over the middle of the field. Over the middle of the field anyways. <laughs> so so whatever. We're not going to get those interceptions. Um, okay, let's move on to Trey Lance. And Lance has been been okay, I think. Um, the accuracy is still a little bit of a concern. Like, got to put got to put the ball in stride yeah. on people. And he has yeah. made some boneheaded throws, um, yeah. you know, in terms of throwing to coverage. Uh, but the thing I want to talk about with you is how do you see that 49ers offense – uh, working this year if if Lance is the starter or even if Lance kind of comes in for uh, a few plays here and there? Um, I think this is something that you'll probably touch on or that we'll touch on when we get to the Patriots. But I think that what Shanahan's looking at, um, I, was watch, I was watching them pretty closely in this last game. And one thing that's kind of clear is that there's this two offenses thing happening with the two where the second that Lance comes in, Juszczyk is out. They're not in 21 personnel anymore. 
They're not in 12 personnel anymore. They're going to spread the ball out, and they're going to use the threat of Trey Lance's legs to create the additional gaps in the running game that a use check would, that a second tight end would. So now you can run kind of like your counter schemes, your power schemes, that inverted veer stuff that that was very popular, you know, in the college in the college rank, something that he did a whole lot at North Dakota State. You know, you get into those power read types of situations. That way you can create those additional gaps through the threat of Trey Lance's legs. The issue with him right now, like you said, is the drop back game. So because he's not really there as a drop back passer, it makes it a little bit tougher out of out of eleven personnel. You know, from a coverage perspective, being able to read guys out, they don't have top flight, you know, true real number one receiver types yeah. either. That's not the build of the offense. That offense is just built to have certain guys fit in certain roles and to use the run game to, as a number one receiver, basically. They're manufacturing open receivers by the threat of the run. So, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see how just how much they build in for him early in the early in the year. I actually think for as much as I would like to see Lance, I think that Shanahan's approach of kind of slow walking him is the best because Jimmy, you know, for all of his faults, he can manage that 21 personnel outside zone, the bootleg stuff in his sleep that will keep them ahead of, ahead of the sticks. And then you can bring Lance in on third and two, third and three, third and four, where you're just close enough to where the run game is still an option. You can run that power read stuff. You can maybe get into some RPO game stuff. Something that's very simple for him is layup throws or put your head down and use your feet to go get us three, four, five, six yards. Um, and that, that'll be, I think, what we can expect for him. And, you know, if Jimmy's not, you know, if Jimmy's not showing that he can handle that early down stuff, then maybe they are in a best, in a, in a best position to just go ahead and put Lance out there and kind of throw him to the fire. But I would expect this to be like a six, seven, eight week thing before we even really get to that conversation of whether or not. Trey Lance is ready to take over the helm. Yeah. Like he's just not there I don't think from so. a drop back passing from a drop back passer perspective yet. Uh and I think the thing with Jimmy is like or the 49ers in general is like they're just won't they're not gonna be as bad as last year. The injury luck That's is really, horrifying. I mean, they're, they're they're a good Their they're defense be is gonna team. be so much better this yeah. year because they're actually gonna have their guys <laughs> this year. Um and for that reason alone, it'll be easier on the quarterback, you know. Uh, okay, let's let's get to the Bears and, and Justin Fields. Uh, I think we both had the same thoughts on him uh, coming out of Ohio State where we couldn't believe that he would drop all the way to what is 11th or 13th. Like We really thought he was maybe one of the top three or top two quarterbacks to come out since Andrew Luck, really. That's what we right. thought. So, And it's kind of been proven that a bit. I mean, his accuracy is lights out. He puts the ball wherever he wants to put it. But he's still doing some... Justin Fields stuff. And the situation hasn't been, you know, because Dalton has started a couple of games, he hasn't been playing, uh, you know, from the jump. And that, that changes things kind of like we talked about with Zach Wilson, playing against twos, playing against threes, whatever. Wilson's thing, I think, is still just like, uh, Wilson, uh, Fields' thing, I think, is still just like, he wants to be a quarterback so bad with this guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, he wants to go through all his reads and he wants to use his legs only as a last resort. And it's like sometimes we just you want to speed up that process a bit. And you can see with his average time to throw, I think after two weeks, it was up above three seconds. I'm not sure where it is after after this week's games. But, um, yeah, he just wants to be a quarterback so bad. But he's talented and I think it'll end up working out. Yeah, I'm, I'm confident that this is going to be just fine. I mean... What, what I saw in the three weeks, I, I tried to watch them pretty closely. You can, I had a strong field stake, so I wanted to make sure that if I was going to get dunked on, I could get ahead of it if she wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> but to your point, I mean, you can see he's very clearly trying to read out every progression. And eventually, I think that the peak for him in his career is when he gets to the point where he understands that his legs are his greatest asset and that is not a knock on his arm. Yeah. Um, he has, you know, I think that he has all the arm talent in the world. Um, he can make just about every throw. Um, and it's going to help his timing, in my opinion, just like Cam, because I thought that Cam early in his career would be late on some things because he's trying to make sure that he reads everything as mm -hmm. precisely as possible. And sometimes, man, the best option is, hey, I know I can fit the ball into this window. If it's not there, I'll, I'll extend with my legs try to find the second thing if the second thing's not there the check down is me you know 
being your own check down is is an asset in itself. And he's going to have to do that to manufacture space for his receivers um, as well. Um, that's going to be a big piece of it. And that's going to open up the game for him. You know, there are just not going to be a lot of defenses that can handle a guy who runs a legit 4-4, yeah. you know, out on the perimeter. That's, you know, that's the kind of athleticism that we're talking about with Fields. And I want to see him maximize that. And that's going to help him with this offense that has a horrible, horrible chance of protecting him on a play-by-play basis. Uh, they're probably not going to have much of a run game either. And because he's going to be in so many drop back situations when he eventually takes over, because this Andy Dalton thing is not going to last very long, in my opinion, he's going to have to use his legs early to keep teams in games. And what I saw in the preseason is he's still able to keep his eyes down the field as he looks to extend. And when he's out on the open field, man, that he's a tough tackle, yeah. you know, he's tough to get to and he's tough to tackle and he's going to be able to find a lot of cheap yards for their offense this year. And hopefully they get, you know, maybe a different offensive guy in there to lead them, you know, going forward. Because I would like to see him in a different scheme than what I think Nagy is preparing for, for them this year. Uh, at Justin Fields' average time to throw this preseason is 3.47 seconds, which is, like, insane. And that's with a horrible offensive line. Yeah. So that says a lot about Who, him trying yeah. to navigate pockets and yeah. waiting, waiting as long as possible to throw the football which is good for him mentally, but I think that just for, you know, the long-term prospects of his career, leaning on his legs is going to be his greatest. Okay, so, yeah, we said we're going to talk about the Patriots and doing something similar with the um, – that the 49ers are doing, but this time Mac Jones versus Cam Newton. So, well, first of all, with Jones, he's, he's also been good. He's hit everything he's had to hit. Um, again, he's coming in off the bench, so he's not starting games. Uh, sometimes you know not playing against ones, but and and his arm strength, it looks like he has more zip on the ball than I remember, um, you know, watching the tape from last year at Alabama. So that's that's you know it's pretty improved. good. It's, I, it I definitely it's has improved. improved. Yeah, um, and he's making really good plays. But so again, going back to the same thing with two offenses, this is the question that you know Belichick and McDaniel's are going to have to make is like well. With Newton, we're running a certain type of offense, and with Mac, we're running a different type of offense. Sixty-six uh, percent of Mac's passing plays have been from eleven personnel, so lighter personnel grouping, while only forty-two percent have been in eleven personnel when Cam is throwing the football. And then you can even go further and say like Mac is throwing from open formations, so formations where maybe there's a tight end or a fullback on the field but he's not attached to the offensive line, so that we call those open formations. He's getting them at about 68% of the time, whereas Cam is getting them at 52% of the time. So two completely different offenses. You have one where you are going to um, play heavy, run the football, try and get play action, hard, hard play action with Cam, and then obviously use the quarterback run stuff that um, that you can do with Cam. And then with Mac, it's like completely different. It's... the it, Cam Newton did get one snap and empty the whole preseason. Now, it's not like a huge sample size, but like he didn't get one snap and empty. Whereas I believe uh, Mac Jones had four, has 14 already snaps and empty. Right. So, like, that, that's different. Like, what, like, how you kind of blend this together and um, in a way that I think is not going to be like the 49ers are doing because there's no reason that there's no reason to like put up. To kind of do it in reverse and like take a runner off the field and Cam Newton to put like a pocket passer in, yeah. whereas the opposite makes sense. Um, you know, we've seen it forever where you take the pocket passer off, you take Drew Brees off, and you put Taysom Hill in. You Taysom take Hill, Gar- right. Garoppolo off, and you put Trey Lance in. The, the, the reverse doesn't right. make it. Yeah, the reverse doesn't make as much sense. So they're gonna have to make a decision and say like, this is the guy we're going with. That means if you know if Cam Newton's the guy we're going with, that means the reps in practice. You know, Jones is not going to get a lot, a lot of reps in practice, and is he going to get a ton of of those type of reps that suit his style? I don't know. So that, that, I think that's something interesting to see. But again, Mac has played has played pretty well. I think. Yeah, I think he's been good. And to your point, I think that the way that it's been throughout the preseason is kind of untenable for them throughout the throughout the course that's of it. the regular season, like. They're all they're basically they're basically breaking Josh McDaniels offense that he had for Tom Brady in half and giving mm. them to two separate quarterbacks. Like with Mac Jones, it's like, 
okay, we, we feel that we can trust you in empty or we're trying to see if we can work you out in empty, right, with some of those quick game throws. And we'll get into 11 personnel as well, you know, and try to work some of those high lows and, you know, some of those in-breaking routes and stuff like that that we had for Tom when he was here. And then with Cam, it's like, okay, we're going to run side of the offense that was like, we'll be, quote, unquote, multiple out of these two back and two tight end sets where we can stress out these defenses by creating extra gaps in the running game. And then we'll just try to hit, make these quick hit play action passes off of it. That, it just doesn't, I don't see how that can work itself out throughout the flow of a game long term. Like, the, that approach of offense that they have for Cam Newton needs to have the 11 personnel and empty stuff as well in order to force a defense to have to live in two worlds as well. Having an offense that's trying to live in two worlds does not do the exact same thing to a defense if you're not using the same quarterback or the same kinds of offensive personnel as you're as you're operating through it. So, you know, eventually, again, this is another situation where I'm like, you know, I love Cam. You know, I I thought that the New England thing is a good was a good fit for him, and I still think that what they're trying to do with him with some of that two back and two tight end stuff fits where he's at right now as a quarterback. I think that that's the right move. But for the Patriots and what they're trying to do, again, I wouldn't be surprised if six to eight weeks into the season, they're just like, you know what, man, Mac, even if this isn't what, even if this isn't your best deal, you know, being precise out of these two back, two tight end sets and play action, you got to figure it out. Or we've got to scrap that part of the playbook for the rest of the year, you know, or only run limited things out of it. And then maybe you switch what you do with Cam. And maybe you just use Cam like as a battering ram in those personnel sets, you know, and and that might have to be it. But, you know, to your point, because they're breaking this offense in half, I, I don't see how you can make the flow of the game work with both of these quarterbacks. One of these guys is going to have to be hit. And I think long term for the Pats is probably going to have to be Mac Jones. I mean, they took him in the, with the 15th pick. You got to. I mean, like, I, to me, you got you got to. It's not a talent, and to me, it's not a talented enough offense to justify doing all this toggling back and forth. Like you're, you're going to end up not being good at either. Yeah. In my opinion, I think you've got to pick and stick with what you've got. Yeah, and and I do think Cam will be better this year. You know, the, there was COVID. You know, coming in there, uh, he's been injured for like three straight years. He gets COVID on a new team. Like it's not, uh, he misses games. Like I think he'll be better. But, um, yeah, I agree. Long term, uh, it's not really the spot for Cam. I think they're going to end up going with Jones. Um, and, again, that's not saying anything crazy because they picked him with the 15th overall pick. Uh, okay, one more, one more um, NFL point to talk about is uh, Teddy Bridgewater getting the start over, getting the starting knot over uh, Drew Locke in uh, Denver. I believe we haven't t- talk, really talked about this. I believe we're on the same page here. But... Uh, mm-hmm. I'm a Teddy guy. You know, I love Teddy. And I think he he is better. He's a better quarterback than Drew Locke. Um, I think he's better. I think the one thing everyone will say is, well, you get these like explosive plays from Drew Locke, which honestly, I don't think it's sustainable what he's I doing. Think that's so overblown. it's like, I think it's overblown like I think, crazy. Yeah, it's really overblown to me. So you're, you're, so like you're fine with Teddy. Like you're still going to get almost probably, maybe a little less because it is Teddy. But my thing with Teddy is like, I believe every year I believe in Teddy. <laughs> and I think, because like, I think physical talent, he's great. He understands offense. He understands how to play quarterback. He just like refuses to throw the ball to interesting places on the field. And that's that's that's, that's what it is. <laughs> that, that's what it is. And to me, you know, my issue, my issue when I, re- I railed against it when I found out about it on Twitter and it's really not an anti-Teddy or an anti-Lock thing. It's just an anti-organizational yeah. direction issue. I don't understand if you were if you were entering this season where the rookie, the quarterback that you draft, not rookie quarterback, the quarterback that you drafted a few years ago, still has to prove his job. You don't draft a replacement, and you bring in a veteran that you believe that a journeyman veteran that you can believe that can take his job. Then that means that you don't have an answer at quarterback right now. You know, like that's really what the issue was to me. And if that's the if that's the direction you were going to go, you might as well have just wrote it out with Drew Locke. I, I don't understand why if you're not going to draft a quarterback yeah. and you're bringing in a backup who can maybe serve you in case of emergency, 
and you end up feeling like he beat the guy out in training camp. Yeah, that's not good. That to me, that that's a reflection that this is a lame duck year for everybody. It's a lame duck year for the quarterback. It's a lame duck year for the head coach. You have a really good defense. That you're basically punting on a year with. I don't understand how there's any any avenue for success, and you're playing in one of the more competitive divisions in your in the league. And you know that the cream of the crop is probably counting two wins against you <laughs> anyways. So, you know, that's why I'm like, this could, this might end up being like a complete meltdown season. And it's not any fault at any fault of Teddy Bridgewater's. I think that he's going to be the same quarterback that he's always been. I like Noah Fant. I like Jerry Judy. You know, I like Hamler. I like the threats that they have. And I think that their offensive scheme is sound. You can make it work. I just thought they had a golden opportunity either by trade or by draft go out and improve this improve this situation and they decided to do neither and now you're stuck with a decent journeyman veteran yeah. backup quarterback you know after you spent the last two years convincing your fan base that Locke was the guy and he could be the guy in spite of the fact that everybody who was looking at the, the data in the video telling you that like he's just another eh quarterback you know who probably, you know, on the on the whole, probably does cost you more games than he wins you. Um, so, you know, I, I felt like it was a pretty clear answer on what they needed to do, and it's just disappointing that they didn't make the move that I thought they could have been. Could have been Justin it, Fields taking the guy's job. Yeah. The, the thing with Teddy is, obviously, every year I, I'm going to believe in him. So this is the year, and they're going to make the playoffs. <laughs> But, the, you know, the, the issue with Teddy is, and you can, kind of like, and with a lot of these journeymen and kind of, like, middling quarterbacks is always the same thing where you're like, well, the, you're going to punt. You, you know, he's not going to turn the ball over. You're going to punt. But, like, punts aren't good, man. Like, what we got to – Right. What, what, what world do we – like, do we, do we convince we ourselves – We do not celebrate punts. <laughs> like, that punts are great for the offense. You know, right. and that was the issue with like, you know, when he played those uh, five games as a Saints starter when Breeze got injured in 2019 was just like, yeah, well, he's not turning the ball over. It's great. It's perfect. But they, they were scoring like they barely scored on offense again in three of those games. And they just got lucky that the defense and the special teams the showed defense up. defense was just like elite. You know, you're talking For about For those like, like five games, level. they were elite. Uh, so it's like you're punting. You're not actually saving yourself or anything. Right. But again, Teddy breakout season. This is the year. It's finally coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm using your um, I'm using your strategy of not uh, not writing off a quarterback until his third contract. Uh, yep. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, all right. Um, uh, before we get into our little bit of college football discussion, only because there there was only. Um, Handful. Only a, a handful of games. Uh, I just want to talk about um, our newest uh, ad partner for the Two High Podcast, which I'm super excited about. Uh, that is Home Field Apparel. And if you are um, watching on YouTube right now, you see I'm wearing a purple shirt. That purple shirt is an LSU shirt. And um, so Home Field Apparel, that's from Home Field Apparel. It's a premium co collegiate clothing brand out of Indianapolis. Uh, incredibly comfortable. Uh Officially licensed apparel with vintage college designs. So I have like a script Louisiana State University logo. Uh, Homefield is in the middle of big new Saturday season two where they launch a new school collection every Saturday at noon Eastern for 16 straight weeks. So they just did Georgia, Wisconsin and Florida and uh, coming up this weekend and Boise State and coming up this weekend. They have the North Carolina Tar Heels. Honestly, if you don't know Homefield Apparel, you need you need Homefield Apparel in your life. Uh, some of the best t-shirts, especially yeah. the last few weeks. And I'm like, if you guys have not seen some of the vintage UNC logos, when this thing drops, <laughs> I'm telling it's going, it's going to fly off. It's going to go off. I, I can promise you that all the Georgia stuff looks good. I'm waiting, you know, hoping that they can get, you know, some of my favorite, some of my nine favorite programs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're going to license the Yankees. So I think, yeah, that's the <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I got to get my Yankees, Dodgers, <laughs> Lakers, <laughs> USC, Alabama combination T-shirt. Uh, yeah, I, I actually went. I got um, I got an LSU hoodie, an LSU T-shirt, and then so I'm an LSU fan. People know that, but I'm secretly like a Tulane fan. So I also got some Tulane. I'm not. You're not supposed to be a Tulane and LSU fan, but you know, my dad. The reason I'm an LSU fan is because my dad. 
um, I was born in Louisiana, but my dad was, mm-hmm. you know, teaching at Tulane. Uh, Tulane right. But the thing is, like, you know, you move back to Montreal in like 1990, and you go try and find a Tulane game on TV, and I got happen. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> it's yeah, not gonna good happen. Luck. So I became I mean, nobody's an LSU mad fan. about repping the Green Wave. I mean, that's an elite mascot. Elite mascot. Um, elite anyway, so let, let's let's get into a little bit of college football discussion. We had two interesting, um, let's say, Power Five games. Um, I, I'm a, San Jose State and Fresno State getting wins. That's great for them because they're going to be in there in the mix in the Mountain West. Um, but the two interesting games of the weekend were Hawaii and UCLA and uh, the Big Ten starting their season with Nebraska and Illinois. Uh, we start in the Big Ten. Is it over for Scott Frost? Like, that's it, right? Yes. Yeah, it's over. Yes, it, it, it's over. I, I hate to say it, dude. I mean, on so many levels. Well, like, you kind of like to say it's over. It's like, whatever. <laughs> it's like that's fine we don't need um, to see this anymore i'm i'm ta- i was taking notes on it and like literally the first thing i wrote was just Martin- martinez ain't it he's just he just ain't it as a quarterback i'm sorry they, they've tried it you know we, we've done this martinez thing it doesn't work but i think if you look at it like from a ten thousand foot view and this is something that i actually was kind of interested to bring up to you like is that era of like the oregon spread option stuff like can we actually classify that as a fad i know that it was fought against so hard from 2010 to 2013 or 2014 or whatever before trip went to Philadelphia. But I think it's fair to say that that was really just a flash in the pan moment. Cause if you look at Ryan day, he was always more of the quarterback on the quarterback side of it. He was always more of like the pure passing progression. That's clearly what he's doing at Ohio state. That's what uh, urban Meyer brought him in to do when he was the offensive coordinator before he took over as a head coach. I mean, chip, I think, and we'll get to it when we talk about UCLA I think he's starting to trend back toward some of like the four open spread zone stuff that he was doing. He's getting away from some of the two tight end stuff that he was doing early in his tenure at UCLA. But even then you don't see like all of the jets and the bubbles and that type of stuff. None of that spread option stuff that used to be there. That's not there anymore. Scott Frost is basically the only guy from those early Oregon staffs that did it. I mean, Helford did it at Oregon for a little bit after he took over when Chip left and it all got stopped. Like he lost his job. The the offense petered out when Helford took over and he had Mariota there, the best quarterback, maybe the best quarterback there since like the early 2000s or the nineties for Oregon. And it didn't look the same. So that was like my big takeaway. Um, You know, and then you kind of look at some of the data, like the offense is static. Everything is like out of 11 personnel. I don't understand the ideas behind, like, they don't run any RPOs. I Some don't spread understand, options. man. The RPOs that they do run, I'm like, these are all just, like, the orbit screen. Yeah, it's just stuff. a triple option. It's not... Like, it's not... There's no downfield threat to it. Um, they're not really maximizing their space. Like, when they have two oh my God. split out, they're, they're stacked on top of one another. Dude. So I'm like, you're not generating any additional space. You're playing against a team that's in cover one. And you're not stretching them all the way out to the sideline. So I don't understand that from the perspective of running the option and not trying to create all the space in the world. You know, some of the crosses that they're trying to run off of play action, I think that's fine. Like Coastal does that, you know. Coastal makes that work out of the spread option. Yeah. But what they have that Nebraska don't is a quarterback that can do it all. That's the big that's a huge difference. If you're gonna run the spread option, it requires a quarterback that does it all. He has to manufacture all the space for everybody else. They don't have UCF speed, so these crossing routes, it's just not breaking open. These outside these outside fades that you would typically throw against cover one in this type of op- in this type of offense, they're not there. If they're not there against Illinois, God help you against the rest <laughs> of the Big Ten competition. Yeah. So that was really like on every level, I, I was just like, this isn't working, this isn't working, this isn't working. And then I came to this horrific thought that Brett Bielema might be running a more modern and appropriate offense <laughs> in 2021 than Scott Frost. And I don't think that anybody ever wants to walk away from a game thinking that Brett is a more modern offensive coach. And that's kind of how I felt by the end of it. You know, I think that the, the Frost era is definitely over. And this was like, this might have been the nail in the coffin because you just can't start. you like, it's, you know, year three now. You just can't start it with a loss to it. And Illinois is not going to be good this year. Right. That's not a good this program. This is a, a brand new staff, a, an entirely new staff. Who they did who not have to, a good year. Who have to put year. in their backup quarterback who like, hasn't had a good college career so far. 
both quarterbacks, you know, whether it's Peters or Sitkowski, they haven't had good college careers so far. Like, this is not a good Illinois Defensively, team. Defensively, they literally only played cover one. That's where they're at right now. They're not even doing anything yeah. interesting, and they couldn't move. The could ball. get separation. It was they horrible. could. The offensive line was 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 not good, and then Martinez. When people were open, Martinez just couldn't hit him. So yeah, I, I think it's it's just it's gonna get it's, go from bad to worse this year. I don't expect a lot from Nebraska, and then yeah, it's like I don't even expect that much from Illinois. So what did we? You know, this was a game that Nebraska, like Illinois, could have lost this game, and like nothing would have changed. Right, but Nebraska losing it, it means it's. We just know it's. At over least now. you know if they go out and they handle their business and blow themselves out. At least Nebraska can lie to themselves and say that maybe something is happening yeah. here, or maybe that you can make something happen and maybe Frost just isn't the guy for it. But I was like, man, it's thirty to nine. Yeah, against Illinois, like this, it just can't happen, man. To open the season, that that was it was just a horrid start, and I can't imagine that it gets much better going forward. And I think their issue, one of the issues, and I and I shouldn't bring this up because I don't know for, I don't know, and I'm probably talking on my ass here, but like, from what I was told recently, um, I think when Frost came to Nebraska, obviously, like you said, he started at Oregon um, with Chip Kelly, but then he he as a head coach, he's there in Central Florida, and I think the idea was that he tried to bring in a lot of the Florida kids to Nebraska and it couldn't get them into school or this or that, or, or they just wouldn't come, and now you're, you're scrambling, and they have to bring in a lot of transfers, they have to bring in a lot of, like, these type of players, yeah. and it just, it's a mess. It's a mess. It just there. hasn't happened, man. just hasn't it happened. It was a nice story when it started, man, but it, it just didn't work, and I think everybody's kind of got to walk away from the crime scene now. Yeah, and especially, I just think that, especially since he keeps putting his foot in his mouth whenever he speaks out to the public, yes. so that's, like, not helping yes. anything. Yes, I'm like, Fro- Frost can... Frost can use a year as an analyst or a quarterback's coach for a program yeah. that runs a real offense so he can realize, like, there probably just needs to be a little bit more <laughs> yeah, to I'd what he's so. doing. So, anyways, you had already brought up Chip Kelly, but let's talk about them. They blow out. Hawaii um, wasn't a contest from the beginning. But the important thing from a UCLA perspective is now the big game comes because they have LSU coming to the Rose Bowl next weekend. But I think the thing you talk about with uh, with Chip is crazy and how he – well, I don't think they ran – I think he, he kept a lot of stuff hidden. Um, yeah. And uh, so I think that they didn't want to show much for the LSU game coming up, which makes a lot of sense. They were able to get out of it, not showing a lot of run game, outside zone, right. and they had a little – I don't know if I want to call it one-back power – um, where they would pull the backside guard or the center, depending on the front. Sometimes the, the, the tackle on like a zone adjustment, but like didn't show anything. It worked. Zach Charbonnet, the Michigan transfer, it goes for like for like one ten on like six carries. Mm-hmm. Um, you know they start the game off on the fifteen yard line because Hawaii's punter takes a knee when he's catching Ugh. the snap. Like yeah, it was just not a good game. Um, yeah, but yeah, Chip, they they they're they're gonna they're gonna be in for it against LSU, man. DTR uh, uh, Dorian Thompson Robinson was not good against a not a good Hawaii yes. team who they played a bunch of cover one and they could not get anything going. Uh, guess who you're playing At against all. next week? Yeah, <laughs> like you're oh, playing, yeah. Boy. yeah, those corners are a little different. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, know, I mean, yeah. Look the the first thing I saw the first thing I thought as I was going back and watching the film. That was kind of encouraging from UCLA's perspective is what I mentioned earlier. Like they're getting back into like some true spread stuff and I'm seeing like some diversity in the zone running game. Yeah. That was kind of interesting. I'm like, okay, we're getting back into like the stretch out of the gun. Yeah. You're seeing some same side zone stuff, some the same side, one back power. Side. Oh, I, let, let oh. me, uh, let, let me, let me ask you about that. Cause I think it was really interesting. So what UCLA was doing in their run game, they had one run that was like a classic outside zone run from gun so if you look at the first mm-hmm. charbonnet touchdown i believe um mm-hmm. it's outside zone he cuts it back it's beautiful but for the most part their their other stuff was what you would call a same side run so in the right. sense where like you know we think about gun running you have the quarterback and you have the running back standing next to the quarterback and the running back kind of comes across the quarterback's right, face crosses takes, his face crosses right. his face and what they were doing was saying um, the quarterback kind of takes a snap and then like 
almost like lunges towards where the running back the running back doesn't move and then he, the quarterback kind of goes and like brings him the football so we would call it like a same side run so right. from now this is interesting from a defensive perspective because how you, you tell me this how important is where the back is aligned to um defensive uh game planning when you're talking about the gun yeah it's a gun yeah i don't want to to say to say it's everything is hyperbolic. <laughs> it's close though. But but it's close. It's close. Like I can say as a high school defensive coach, we were able to basically build our entire week one game plan off the location yeah. of the back. Like you get you get really but, big. But again, and really I mean, let me, let me the caveat the caveat is you were able to build it the game plan off the location of the back because ninety nine percent of he's, teams are coming are running that where he's coming across the quarterback. Across his face, face yes. We're like, I know that they're running zone in power this way because yes. the back literally has to cross the quarterback's face in order to get to the point of attack. Like, that's a real thing. So the same side zone stuff, and really to me, some offensive coach or offensive mind or, you know, can, can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but the way that I look at it, it's almost like veer in a way. Or like coming out of like the split back, yeah. like split back run game where the quarterback is attacking yeah. the offset back that's in split. So it creates this, you're almost like warping where the run fits are. So there's a run, you know, I, I wish you, you know, podcast, I wish podcasts were more of a visual medium. So I can pull this <laughs> up as we were talking, but there's a run against Hawaii where they run this same side zone where the quarterback is almost turning his back away from where all the blocking action is going. And the running back is almost running in a straight line downhill off the tackles, but and because of the way that the, the run hits in terms of the point of attack, they're cutting the defense in half. Like you're, you're basically walling off the entire front side of the, the entire front side of the front and the linebackers who are fitting. And now you're isolating the defensive end. That was what zone read used to be for, right? Is we know that we want to cut back in zone, but we're going to read, we're going to read the end. So the quarterback can be the seventh blocker, the sixth blocker, whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. We're blocking the end with the read of the quarterback is, is how it used to be kind of described. Now, with these same side zone runs, you don't necessarily have to have the element of the read because you're walling off so much of the defense. So you're able to really hit vertically behind it. I thought that it's an interesting tendency breaker. You can build the whole your whole run game out of it because all teams will do is kind of get into the odd front where they have – that edge rusher, a uh, three or a four eye in the nose. So you're basically covering up the entire weak side of the run game. So, you know, it, it, it lends itself better to fitting it up that way. But if you catch like, if you catch an odd front team that's taking their overhang way out of the run fit, or you catch an even front team that doesn't have its linebackers program to fall back quickly and you get walled off, you can kind of gut the defense and it's really good against like too high where the issues are going to come in is that, you know, like you said, when you're playing a team like LSU next week, that can actually get into cover one, live in it much better than Hawaii did. Yeah. You know, and, and these you're talking about linebackers who can actually get over the top, you know, the LSU has an argument for having, you know, a top two linebacker core in the SEC this year, which, you know, by extension means that you're probably talking about top eight, top 10 in the yeah. country. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's tough. You know, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. And because Dorian Thompson Robinson didn't do a whole lot with his arm to encourage me, I don't know where they're going to be at with him and his legs, you know, actually using him as a runner. You know, like you said, I don't think that they showed a whole lot. I think there will be a, a whole lot more of the run well, game expanded upon against the LSU. They but, didn't boot. They didn't play action off that look at all. Yeah, there was, there was no boot. They really didn't use – they weren't really in like yeah. two eleven personnel with the tight end attached very often. Yeah. I'd have to think that they do that a little bit more against LSU. I don't know if you want to just be in four open all the time against a team that's more athletic than you uh, are. I have the numbers right in front of me. Uh, what is it? Seventy two percent, eighty percent. They were in an open formation. Yeah, that's a lot. so I, I would. It's a lot. That's a lot, and it worked well. You know, they're more athletic than Hawaii, so it makes sense. You know, you put yeah. Hawaii in a bind, you put Hawaii in a bind. They're either going to be in cover one or cover zero, and they've got to make a choice. And they know that that's what they knew that that's what Todd Graham wants to do anyway. So they were able to exploit it. 
next week, I'm not not so tough. sure. It's tough. Not, I don't think I, it's going to be tough. I, I look. I, I literally just outed myself as an LSU fan, but I, I think you can be pretty. Uh, make a pretty good case that this could be a blowout, and the line is only like three and a half or four and a half or something yeah. like that. So I, I would, I would hit, I would hit yeah. that hard if you're if you are a yeah. betting person. I think it's the margin just, is going to be a whole lot wider than that. What we saw from DTR, and again, going back to the same thing, man coverage. There were, he yep. couldn't hit man coverage. He's not accurate enough to 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 com- consistently do it, and the receivers are don't, don't look like they're good enough to consistently beat man coverage. Well, to me, and it's telling. I mean, if you look at their passing game, they really only they only only ran like three or four concepts. Yeah, yeah. Like to me, it's telling that you have a quarterback who's been here as long as he's been there, and you're still kind of babying him. Yeah. You know, against a, a pretty static defensive look where you know where everything where everything should be breaking open at. Like outside of like the mesh wheel that they hit, they didn't really come back to that a whole lot. No. They ran that well, kind that of like clear out concept. Anyway, so. Exactly, exactly. That was more of Hawaii's fault than it was, you know, a good job in the progression, you know, for for DTR. And then, you know, if you look at like when they're in two by two, they basically just ran these comebacks on the outside. They ran one guy up the seam and one guy on the dig. Like that was yeah, basically their yeah, only that, their like, only two by two. That seam with the backside, where they're just trying to run yeah. off the middle of field safety and then yeah. try to get that dig route yeah. or that over route coming, and he's. He had trouble hitting that hit, in the hit whole concept. A couple times, yeah. yeah, the whole concept is built to isolate this one throw, and you're having a hard time hitting yeah. that one throw. It, I, I'd, I'd be shocked. I'd be shocked if they had a good day in the passing game against against LSU next Saturday. Yeah, but like you said, like, with both the passing game and the running game, they didn't show a lot on purpose. They were able to get out of it, um, mostly because they manhandled the, the Hawaii defensive front. I mean, that's really what it came down to. That's what it came down to. They just they manhandled them. It didn't really it wouldn't matter what they were running. They manhandled them. They were, they didn't have to show a lot. You know, it's one of those things. I'm sure they had it if they needed it. Um, because and they, they just ended up not. They needing just ended it. up not needing it. But you'll see a yeah. lot more, I think, um, against LSU. No, I, mean, I just don't know if the personnel works. Silver lining, I think they'll be fine in the Pac-12. I think they'll be more than competitive offensively in the Pac-12. You know, I don't know how high of a bar that is to clear with mm-hmm. the Pac-12 South, you know, but I do think that they'll be able to compete against just about everybody. But, yeah, a game like a game like what's coming up next week, I, I can't see them moving the ball unless DTR, like, plays out of his mind with his legs. It's not going to be with his arm. Yeah. I, I can say – I can just about guarantee that now. You know, Elias Ricks and Derek Stingley – I, I would not bank on them being beat very often on the outside. Um, and, and this is going to have to be a DTR game with his legs. And for as athletic as he is, he's not like, you know, a blow you away athlete. That's not even how he likes to use his athleticism anyways. There were some plays where there were a lot, there was a lot of airspace for him to run into against Hawaii. And I saw him get pulled up on by defensive ends and linebackers or safeties coming out and run support that I felt like, for a guy who's been here this long that I thought was a better athlete than he was, you know, I would have figured that he would have made a guy miss or just outran the angle. And I didn't see that either. So I, I just don't know. I don't know what to take away from this game in terms of how, you know, it prognosticates for, for the LSU game next week. I agree. Go Tigers. Um, all right. Um, <laughs> oh, just a reminder, I forgot to say this before, but uh, if you go to homefield.com, and you want to buy a t-shirt or a sweatshirt or uh, or uh, jogging pants or whatever, promo code PFF gets you 15% off. So uh, yeah, go there and, and get your get your gear uh, for the college football season. All right, that's enough of us. Um, this was episode one of the Too High podcast. Stay tuned for uh, the, uh, episode later this week. We are going to have on um, Packers writer. Uh, Justice, our friend Justice Mosqueda uh, talking about Packers offense, defense and some college football concepts and then we're going to preview um, no NFL yet this week but some huge huge, huge college football games opening weekend opening yeah. weekend in college football so we'll get to that and uh, yeah, we'll see us later this week